Dr. Lewis with the Remnant Radio. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We've got a great episode with Dr. Doug Weaver. We're going to be talking about Pentecostalism, specifically first wave Pentecostalism. But before we jump into the dialogue, uh, Michael, this gives some, some heartfelt moments here, man. I you're, know. You're, you're leaving. I'm leaving the show, you guys. He's I'm cleaning. leaving. He's offended. Spirit I uh, offense. got hired on by another podcast. Uh, False. Just kidding. No, I'm, I'm, my family, we're moving to Denver. Um, there's a chance... I may be here in Dallas for the month of December and might be able to do some more more shows. And if not, I'll still fly in on occasion. But uh, as I know of right now, this is probably the last show I've got as a Dallasite. Mm. As a Dallasite? I don't know. What a, what a, yeah, I don't know what the word would be. Texan, maybe? So maybe if we can, can get Josh out to Denver, Colorado one of these days. And we can, we can sustain Yeah, co- we can ho- pick ship. back up this, this uh, holy uh, binary thing i don't know that that's just i think dumb. that you really tried hard there yeah i, I was appreciate trying, what you did yeah but i just just bros that's all <laughs> well that was awkward and touching all at the same time <laughs> thank you for that michael uh, i'm just uh, so glad you're gonna miss me so much <laughs> i am dr weaver uh for those uh out there who aren't super familiar with you and your ministry tell us a little bit about yourself uh, really encouraged to to hear about your ministry through uh, one of our regular contributors and actually someone who functions kind of as a research assistant on the pro- program, uh, Dawson. So tell us a little about yourself and your ministry, and we'll jump, jump into the topic. Okay, thanks. I appreciate being here with you guys. I teach uh, in the religion department at Baylor University in Waco, uh, Fixer Upper Town, a couple hours from here. Uh, I teach Baptist studies and Pentecostalism, and that's a unique mix for some of them. I've been there since 2003. Uh, mm-hmm. Your buddy Dawson, I'm trying to remember, we probably were together, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago at a small school over in Georgia. Um, I am a Baptist, I'm an ordained Baptist. I have preached in churches, but I've always been an academic. So I have been teaching, this is going to date me, right? I've been teaching since about 1986. Um, When I was in college, my roommate and I were in a school in Mississippi, and it was during the time of the charismatic movement in the mid-70s, and he had the experience of tongues and began to identify as charismatic, and I did not. Um, But we remained friends, and we're good friends now. He's a, a part of the AG, as you described your background. Uh, he's ordained minister. He teaches uh, up in what I call the Mecca of yeah. uh, Pentecostalism in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, <clears throat> when I did my doctoral work, uh, I did the top. The topic was William Marion Branham, and uh. one of the two giants of divine healing in the 40s and 50s alongside of Oral Roberts. Most folks do not know that Branham actually came first. Mm-hmm about six uh, six months before Roberts came onto the scene. Everybody knows Roberts because uh, he transitioned into the electronic church and TV, and Branham did not. Uh, but I, I studied him, and, and actually where I went to school was about 20 minutes from his church, the Branham Tabernacle in Jeffersonville, Indiana. So, so I got fascinated. Wait, his church was called the Branham Tabernacle? The Branham Tabernacle. Who were they worshiping there? <laughs> Well, I, I hate to like drop bombs on people who love this yeah, guy. I don't. That just sounds like a if, sketchy if name. If you want to Google Branham or Google his, I've, Google, I've watched some videos. They're fascinating. Actually. They are fascinating. I mean, he tells somebody their address, the disease they had, and then they'd walk away healed. His, and his followers Facebook? say he never made a mistake. They wow. say, yeah, never. Uh, as his critics said, disagree. That's not true. Yeah. <laughs> Um, if you Google him today, his, his uh, group is called The Message, with a capital M, and essentially it's the idea that people who follow Branham's interpretation of the Bible are part of the— Branhamites. Uh, part of the Branhamites. Well, that, if you call them Branhamites, you're not a part of the group. Oh, that's, okay. That's okay. kind of the code language there. You've got to be a part of The Message. But you're really part of the Bride of Christ, going the rapture. Uh, so oh, that was, exclusive. Yes, yes. But uh, not Oral Roberts. So you kind of lump them together to say they started together. But started you would say together. Branham was first. Started Oral, together. Uh, Branham, is Branham the guy who decided he was Elijah? No. Different okay, guy? There's some mis- mis- misunderstanding about that. But there, there are some people that would claim that he was Elijah. Yeah, yeah. And from what I understand, he would say that if you keep saying this, the Lord's going to take me away. Yeah. But he was actually saying just the opposite, that that was not true. One of the things that I did L- say about got it wrong on one of the things I did say about him, which would be, you know, when you start talking about Pentecostalism, what is the role of the prophet? Sure. Or what is the role of prophecy? And and I did decide that that Branham did move in terms of healing revivalism. That in order to be healed in his meetings, and not his initial meetings, but in his later meetings, you needed to have faith in him as the healer. 
Uh, and not faith in God. As well, it, it, he would say he became the mediator. Now, I, I will agree with you that there were people probably pushing him in that direction. He never claimed to be Elijah, but he does claim to be uh, the forerunner of the second coming of Christ in the same way as the way that kind of a second John the Baptist. Mm. John the Baptist, the first coming. Um, you know, how much of that he came up with himself, I mean, that's, that's speculation. Do we have, like, documented stuff of him saying those kind of things, or was it mostly, he like, will, he will people talk, claiming? He, he won't say, ah, but we have his sermons. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, in fact, his sermons are still published by uh, the message folks in uh, Jeffersonville, Indiana, and they have an international ministry. But in his sermons, uh, it's clearly implied. Hmm. It really is. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, a lot of folks who are involved in Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International uh, brought him in to speak, and they will talk. They usually talk about him as someone uh, who lost the anointing in the sense that he, he crossed over into, into what they would describe as Air. doctrinal heresy. Uh, but he is a fascinating figure. Uh, his, you know, during the heyday of the healing revival in the 40s and 50s, which I would tell you is one of the carryover distinctives of early Pentecostalism, uh, he is known as somebody who could just wow a crowd because he was humble. So watch, if you're talking about a prophet, what does a prophet look like? They said he was humble. His critics said that he was demonic because when people would touch him, he would get real tired, and all of a sudden some of the services simply had to be canceled. Hmm. And they would say, wait a minute, if you really have the anointing, if you're empowered with the Holy Spirit, you shouldn't be getting so weak. But he simply said, "No, that's that's just the human part." So, but nevertheless, uh, he was a he was a dynamic, humble revivalist, and that's how I got started in all this. Um, when I began to teach Pentecostalism at Baylor, uh, and, and Baylor is a, you know, is a school of the Christian heritage, so I, I focus on Baptist. But when I began to to kind of go back to my academic roots. And I go back to the study and what got me interested in Branham in the first place. I just began to see so many interactions between Mm -hmm. Baptists and early Pentecostals. And some of those early uh, founders uh, were Baptists. And so I I have been studying that for the last several years. Excellent. And you you wrote a book uh, here recently on on this subject of uh, the baptism of the Spirit. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, if I can plug that. Yeah, uh, we actually the baptism <laughs> and the Spirit, not the baptism of the Spirit. True. Yeah. Yeah. We actually it's, have the link of it I, in the video right now. I do now, talk so about I do talk about baptism, of the Holy Spirit. I do talk about tongues. Uh, the, the title of the book is Baptist and the Holy Spirit. Got it. Oh. The subtitle is Got the it. contested history with the holiness, Pentecostal, charismatic uh, tradition. So in other words, it really has three parts. How have Baptists been holiness folks or related to that? How have Baptists participated in the Pentecostal movement or opposed it? And I would tell you, some of the, probably the harshest critics of of Pentecostalism in its 100-year history have been Baptists. Uh, And so I talk about that. And then the the last part of the book, and I understand you have some guests in in subsequent weeks, uh, how Baptists have participated uh, in the charismatic movement. Joel Osteen's dad, John Osteen, sure. was a Baptist pastor in Houston uh, and one of the early charismatic leaders in the 60s, so I cover things like that. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's a long book, but uh, go to the website. I think, it'll yeah. be, uh, I think there'll be a discount during Christmas, so take a, look, take a look at it. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, you know— Discount during Christmas, so we got to wait like another month, we were saying. Well, you can go now. I, they have, they've had a 20% discount uh, during the summer, but, you know, you know, after things, what, in another week, start going to the website and take a look. Yeah. So so we we have an opportunity to talk about the first wave of Pentecostalism. And and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm, I'm still learning a lot of this myself. Uh, first wave Pentecostalism was coined by, who do we decide that was? Uh, Fuller guy. Uh, Peter, Peter Wagner. Wagner. Peter Wagner. Is, that, is that fair? Is that yeah. is that true? Okay. So, yeah. so and he wouldn't call it first wave Pentecostalism. First wave. He would just call it the first Full wave stop. of Holy Spirit. Yeah. So, well, so, you know, you, before you start using the wave language, you simply would have called it classical Pentecostalism. Right. And that's I actually have that in the notes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Which is actually what I'm used to using. Classical uh, Pentecostalism. Because you have classical Pentecostalism, which is based on. Yeah, and then I would go to Neo Pentecostalism or slash charismatic movement. And actually, people in that movement called it charismatic renewal. Mm hmm. And then the third wave, and you'll talk about this, I, I tend to associate that more with power evangelism and John Wimber and, and Wagner himself. Uh, now, would uh, if if Wagner sort of coined the phrase third wave," then he w- he is the one who also would later, instead of calling it classical Pentecostalism, he's the one who called it first wave. Right. So, like, what happened out of Azusa and, and that era, mm-hmm. and then uh, second wave being um, 
Now, I'm curious about this. Would you say it was the charismatic renewal, like so, starting in the '60s? Yeah. Or would you say the the latter rain guys? The the guy, you can do Brandon. latter rain in the you can do latter rain about eight, 1948, and that's that's Canada and you know that's all of North America. And actually, Branham is involved in that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can you can start hey, with that. Alan Jack Coe. Yeah, I t- I tend to do it. I mean, again, it depends on who you're reading. I tend to do it with charismatic renewal and and watch the the trigger there is 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 Bennett out in, in Van Nuys, California, but he's not he's not the first one, but. He, um, Bennett, Dennis Bennett, is the person that Time Magazine and News, Newsweek Magazine, they, they publicize what's going on. I mean, before that, you might have denominational magazines or sure. word of mouth, you kinda, you know, what I call in the subculture. But once it hits the national news, Time, mm-hmm. Newsweek, that's the Bennett story when he gets kicked out of his church for announcing he's been baptized in the Holy Spirit and he's spoken in tongues. And that what, kind of thing. what denomination was he a part of? He was Episcopalian. So that's when it hit the liturgical churches, the Catholic Church, yeah. the, the, the Catholic the, Church at Duquesne University, about sixty-seven. Um, yeah, the, the Lutheran Church. Um, in fact, it's real fascinating. It does hit the liturgical churches, and so it does mainstream. Well, they have a. They have a. I, I had the privilege of meeting with a guy named Matteo Calisi. He's the president of the Charismatic Catholic Fraternity okay. at the Vatican, and so they have a whole fraternity that they considered Charismatic mm-hmm. Catholic. Exactly, uh, and they mean, st- yeah, they still do. Started in the '60s with mm-hmm. John Paul II. Uh, was was well, you, Vatican II. You begin Vatican II. You begin to have more openness to different kinds of liturgical forms. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. So, you know, we're hopefully in this episode, you know, for those who are watching, like, hey, we're going to go with this. I'd like to maybe set out the history of okay. what this is first, and then we'll talk about the theological distinctives. Right. Because I think, as you're saying, we're going to find a lot of difficulty looking at a timeline and saying this is when this yeah. started and this is when it stopped. Really, I think the, the, the healthiest way is to determine what these movements are based off of theology. Like, okay. what did these people believe? But let's try to start with the history and then see move into okay. the, some of the last Let me stuff. start with two names, and then if you want me to go backwards, I will. Sure. Uh, but the t- if you're just introducing this to a popular audience, you're sure. going to start with Charles Parham and William Seymour. Uh, you're going to talk with Charles Parham is a, a former Methodist, becomes independent minister. Uh, we would call him a radical evangelical. I, I can define that for you in a minute. But he's going to be a holiness minister. He has a ministry in Topeka, Kansas. He actually visits some other places. Um, but he... He is interested in healing, and so he does teach faith healing. So if I could back up without mentioning names, what we call the holiness movement, which you can go all the way back to John Wesley, but I'm going to date it for you right before the Civil War, something called the Revival of 1858. And the Revival of 1858, uh, people who write books will tell you it has a a perfectionist tendency. It has Mm -hmm. a focus on holiness. Mm -hmm. And there are people like Phoebe Palmer, so actually women preaching. Mm -hmm. But you also have have Wesleyans, you have Arminians, but you also have Reformed, a guy named... A guy named William Boardman writes uh, something called The Higher Christian Life. All right, I'm getting into too many names. What happens in this holiness movement is that holiness start emphasizing four things. Conversion, you can expect, but Jesus is Savior. Mm-hmm. Jesus is Sanctifier. Jesus is Healer. Jesus is Coming King. You can call it the fourfold gospel. A guy named A.B. Simpson, if y'all know mm-hmm. his name, founder of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, actually writes a book about 1890. But think about those. Uh, I can remember them again. Sounds but like Savior, swear. Sanctifier, yeah. Healer, Coming King. All right. If you, if you, those are all 1880s, 1890s. Okay. So you got somebody like Charles Parham comes along and is going to affirm those things. He's going to affirm divine. He, it's real easy to, like, if I deal with a student, they'll go, well, oh, well, uh, Pentecostalism starts focusing on healing. Well, no, healing is actually going on before that time. But he he does have a ministry of healing. He does have a ministry where he's talked about sanctification. The, the traditional story is that uh, January 1, 1901, he's got some Bible students together in Topeka, Kansas, called the Bethel Bible School. And he leaves town, tells his students, why don't y'all, here's an assignment for you. Why don't you look at Acts 2? All right, look, I can tell you this thing both ways. And, uh, he, cause he, and he comes back and he says, hey, what'd y'all find in Acts 2? And they go, oh my gosh, we found Holy Spirit power. We found what we now call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And guess what? What we found there is we know how to get it. 
if God will let us speak in another language. And as the story goes, a woman in his, his, his little Bible school uh, named Agnes Osmond uh, starts speaking in another language, and she claims to speak Chinese. Okay, now let me back up for a moment. And just curious, where does the citation, just to help me out, where do you, where do you read this? Acts 2, 4. No, no, no. no is that no, what you want? No, no I, mean, I mean this story about Agnes. Oh, uh, well, the story, uh, Parham's wife, Sarah Parham, has, an auto, has a story of Parham's life, and that, that's kind of the primary source. Okay. Now you have all these secondary, what I call secondary. But that's a pretty primary. I mean, that's like yeah, somebody's. It's the, it's the, yeah, it's the standard story. Uh, okay, well, the critics are going to say is that Parham himself had already decided that Acts 2, speaking in tongues, was really, really important. And he, you know, he knew the students were going to find that. Well, whatever. Uh, when he does come back, as the story goes, this woman in the group, Agnes Osmond, speaks. Now, again, how does she know it was Chinese? Nobody in the room knew Chinese. But she said God told her it was Chinese. And so some other people began to speak in tongues. And here's the thing. What gets ready to happen is that holiness folks were already talking about Uh, being spirit-filled. They were already talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this is fascinating to me. They were talking about uh, baptism, Holy Spirit language from the book of Acts, but they were using it to define, are you holy? Are you sanctified? Mm -hmm. What's going to happen? What is the main difference then between an early Pentecostal and someone who I would have normally called a holiness believer? It's that Parham comes along and he redefines baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is not sanctification anymore. Baptism of the Holy Spirit has a sign, hmm. and that sign is speaking in tongues. Now, what's speaking in tongues? you got two things. Parm says speaking in tongues was a foreign language. Right. we got a technical term. A known language. Xenolalia. And why would you speak in tongues? Evangelize. Well, Evangelism. That's what, they, that's what they were thinking, right? That's why the oh. worldwide mission movement. We're talking right? about. Y'all remember? I don't know how old y'all were <laughs> back when 2000 hit and there was going to be Y2K and all that. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. Something. We happened. were there for Y2K. Okay, you're, you're, we'll you're, date ourselves. Okay. Well, I was. <laughs> I had a what? I had a 17 year old then. Uh, uh, yeah. But watch. Remember the excitement. So remember one of those four things for the holiness folks. Jesus Soon is coming king. Jesus coming king. So God's going to give you, I mean, I teach at an educational institution. We want you to take languages. But if the world's getting ready to come, in, come to an end, get the language. You don't have to go to school. That's God right. will give you the, in other words, this is a miracle. God's going to give you the language. You don't have to study for it. And he's going to what? He's going to help you evangelize. And that's the key thing. I mean, these folks are evangelists and they want to, there's that whole idea. We've got to share the whole gospel to the whole world before Jesus can come back. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that this led to a worldwide missions movement because if you got a language, if you got baptized in the Spirit according to their definition and you got a language, then you were supposed to go to whatever country. Uh, you were. In fact, early Pentecostals. A lot Pente- of very disappointed missionaries, uh, I'd imagine. Right. <laughs> early Pentecostals do uh, go everywhere. Now, that's the first person. That's Charles Parham. Okay. I want you to move to the second person. And the second person is William Seymour. William Seymour is African American. It's a fascinating history. Uh, a guy named Gaspin Espinosa has written the best biography of him. But Seymour uh, travels through Cincinnati. He's a holiness preacher. There are the reason I got first interested in him because there are books out there that say he was a Baptist for a little while. Mm. But he goes. Uh, he meets a holiness Baptist preacher in Jackson, Mississippi. He ends up. He winds up in Houston. Okay, Parham. This is the irony of this. If this explosion was going to happen in 1901, Parham doesn't stay in Kansas. You know, <laughs> Dorothy leaves, he leaves. Yeah. And so he ends up in Houston, Texas, right down the road. And he starts another Bible school. But it is a Bible school where he, you're supposed to teach by prophecy and revelation. He's supposed to teach the end of the world. And he was teaching, he was teaching that speaking in tongues and other language was a sign of the Holy Spirit baptism. William Seymour gets invited Out of there. curiosity, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll, for a point of clarification, the sign or a sign at this time? Okay. All right. Well, that, that's a part of the debate. Okay. I will tell you that Parham says it was the sign. The sign. Yes. Parham for sure. Was Parham like, was. It is the sign. Seymour. If you're going to talk about Parham, you're going to say that Parham is a guy that said speaking in tongues, a foreign language, is the sign. Unilaterally, yeah. always yeah, said it. Sign. But, and so, one of the early okay. debates in early one of the debates in early Pentecostalism is it the sign or not? Okay. 
Yeah, but yeah. he's going to say that. And in there were fact, some still that say a sign, not the sign. But, yeah, yeah. Well, also the holy, the, the holiness folks. You don't want to think that tongues just pops up in 1901. That, sure. That's a part of the story that's false. That's there are other people that there are people that are talking about having experiences of tongues in the 80s and the 90s, but they're not. What they're not doing is they're not saying it's the sign, and mm. they're really not necessarily connecting it to what you and I would call. Um, being Glossolalia yeah or, they're not doing yeah. that so it's just more they're having this an ecstatic religious experience so you would say that that is a uh, not necessarily common but exists throughout church history and it wasn't just like yeah, boom it showed up at 1904 yeah, yeah well I see uh, yeah. I read uh, John Howie's uh, Scots Worthies, written in 1781, and he tells stories of people during the Scottish Reformation that were speaking in tongues. Yeah. Edward Irving's a name back there. Uh, uh, sporadic. Sure. I mean, even go back to the second century, Montanism. Now, if, sure. if you're a cessationist and say all those things stop. Those are just heretics. <laughs> yeah. If, if, if you say all that stuff stops with the, with the Bible era, mm-hmm. okay, you just deny some history, I guess. Dang. I don't think that works. Uh, yeah. It's just... Now, to find some chain of that, you know, this group pass it to this group. I don't think you want to go there. You can't do that. So. Sure. Let me go back to that. sporadic all throughout Yeah, history. sporadic. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons why some, if you don't like it, you simply go, it was sporadic. Sure. It hadn't been emphasized all that much. If you do like it, you'll go, well, wait a minute. It has existed. It, it, sure. it hasn't ceased. So. Uh, go back to Seymour. Okay. If Seymour winds up in Houston, invited by... Uh, a nanny, let me just use that language, of uh, someone who'd worked for a parm. This is segregated South. Mm-hmm. Seymour is not allowed in the room, but parm lets him sit uh, next to an open door, basically out in the hallways and debate on exactly where he was, but he gets to listen. African American, holiness preacher, accepts what Seymour says about Holy Spirit and tongues. He doesn't have the gift himself, but he accepts it. He gets an invitation to go to L.A., and all of a sudden we now are talking the rest of the story because as that story, he goes out there and talks to some a group of holiness African-American believers, and he tells them, you don't have the Holy Spirit. Oh, my gosh, how would you like somebody to tell you you don't have the Holy <laughs> Spirit? It doesn't work. And they kick him out. But some of them let him continue to preach, and he preaches. It's, some, it's a part of this, what I call uh, early Pentecostalism myth, and I don't use that word, in a, I don't use that in a bad way, but it's the story of a word. It's origins. the folklore. They, yeah, they it's folklore. The door. And he's, he's preaching at something called the Bonnie Bray Street House, and all of a sudden they start having people come yeah. in and listening. They have to go, they get a, a ch- an old church, warehouse, uh, uh, African American Episcopal Church, and, and the, it's, it's called 312 Azusa Street. Yeah. It was and an Episcopal just, church. Yeah, old-fashioned. But it was basically, you just find in a storefront building, a warehouse, and you go in and you fix it up. And they start having services. And uh, the reason they have to move there, because in this house on what's called Bonnie Bray Street, people start testifying that they got the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And they speak in tongues. And the group grows. And so the porch you, buckled, right? Yeah. Like, there's yeah a, there's really. all kind, I've heard all the stories. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, it, and it's a fascinating story. And so all of a sudden, the Azusa Street miracle, the Azusa Street revival, I mean, it's easy. You, okay, who is the famous, most famous revivalist in the 20th century? Everybody's going to go, Billy Graham. Okay, I don't deny that. What's the most famous revival of the 20th century? It's the Azusa Street Revival. Mm-hmm, sure. 1906, April 1906, they're going to talk about having a continuous revival for three years. Some will even go that it's up to seven years where they're just there 24 hours a day and people start coming. Who, who starts attending this thing? Okay, holiness fucks. It's just like this network of people. And people start going to L.A. They are integrated Mostly poor people, but it's working class, and that's a debate. It's early Pentecostals and mostly poor people are working class. Uh, I think it's both. But nevertheless, you start having this revival, and you do have a movement. And people come from all over the country. Again, mostly they are, they are from Methodist background. They are from Baptist background. And many of them get the spirit. They go back home. Some of them head off internationally. And, uh, and you do have a movement. So you, know, you have two founders. One is the white palm. The other is the African-American Seymour. So it depends on what book 
So this whole idea is that early Pentecostalism is known to be an integrated movement. I mean, this is 1906 America. That's pretty interesting. It's pretty powerful stuff. Now, when you really start telling the story, though, uh, there's some pretty bad racism in the story. There's no doubt. Yeah. Well, I was actually uh, I'm confused on this because I had heard, and I can't remember where I read this, which book I read it in, but that one of the things they thought the baptism of the Holy Spirit did at that time was not only the, the tongues thing, although that was a major <laughs> component, but... Um, or obviously, you would know better than me. Um, but the other thing they said was racial racial reconciliation. Okay, sure. And it, was that an, was that an element and a part of that doctrine that this baptism of spirit was going to bring the races 16 together? Sixteen geographical in the regions. Sure. Of Pentecost. Yeah. Uh, the Holy Spirit baptism from the Wesleyan side is purity, holiness. Uh, but then you have, I get into a lot of stuff here, you've got something called the Keswick movement, but there's another part of holiness uh, belief that focuses on power. So let's just take that purity and power. Well, a part of the purity would have reconciliation. So it is a part of the origin story that early Pentecostalism breaks racial barriers. But that didn't hash out too well at Azusa. It doesn't work very long. And yeah. in, in part of what happens, uh, it's, it's a fascinating story. There, there are two parts of this. One part we don't tell very often. There were folks of Hispanic background there, and some studies have been done on this, that they are L.A. folks. And uh, it doesn't take more than a couple years for some of the leaders at Azusa to start treating the folks that have Mexican background with second class, mm. like second class citizens. So that's a part of the story. The part that we know a little bit more about is Parham. Here's a question. Is, is, if Parham is a person that really does the formation of the doctrine, but do you want somebody that everybody now calls a racist to be known as the founder of your group? Sure. Because when he leaves, uh, notice, he, he doesn't let, who, who would expect him to, but he doesn't let Seymour in his room uh, in Houston. But when he, he travels to L.A., actually he travels to L.A. at Seymour's invitation. Come so, out here. So to be clear, those who are watching, he was teaching. Uh, was, uh, uh, Parham was teaching and would not allow Seymour into the classroom. Exactly. Because, because he was an African-American. Well, you didn't do that in Houston, Texas oh, in sure. 1906. Right. So you could say, okay, you're simply following social customs. But when you see him go out to L.A. and the revival's going on and maybe he's jealous, but he goes out there, he actually tries to take the movement over. Oh, yeah. When he gets out there, he expects Seymour to take second uh, and Seymour – Seymour and everybody just is astounded. He gets out there, and the worship is extremely emotional, extremely ecstatic. It's what have uh, slain in the spirit. Now watch. What is slain in the spirit? I guess, uh, you know, falling down, involuntary. What spirit-led yeah, falling down, right? You're falling down sure. in the spirit. That's, that, that's not created by Pentecostalism, though. You have that in the holiness movement, too. Sure. But now you all of a sudden have... When you speak in tongues and receive the Holy Spirit baptism, you usually are going to be slain in the Spirit too. I would argue with you guys or contend with you that right now, if you really want to talk about somebody that's Pentecostal, they're going to affirm being slain in the Spirit as much as anything else. Really? Yes, I would. Yeah. Uh, Man, if we had only invented the slanket back then, we'd be <laughs> so, so wealthy. We are working on, okay. for those of you who are watching, the slanket, the slain in the spirit blanket <laughs> that we are going to sell to Pentecostal churches. <laughs> that might be a little irreverent, oh, but it's good. funny. Uh, continue. When you go to California and all of a sudden he starts using racist language to describe Seymour, and it is racist. In fact, it's so racist, I'm not going to repeat it on his show. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. All right. The, uh, so he leaves. He tries to take over. It doesn't work. And then after this, and I know you know this part of the story, Seymour all of a sudden changes his mind and says, you know, baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's Bible, but the sign doesn't have to be tongues. Sure. And, and I'm convinced, and I would be not the only one, is that that's a reaction to Parham. Mm. Now, it does broaden it out. It means that uh, you can be Pentecostal, you affirm tongues, but it doesn't have to be the sign. Uh. There are some other things that as you begin to uh, – he has two or three other white Christians who try to take over the Azusa Street uh, and watch, it's called the apostolic mission. So think about that term. It's We're going back and retrieving what the apostles did. But he has some other white folks that tries to, to take over. And, and so really in, within 15 years, Parham develop, excuse me, Seymour develops a polity at, 
at his church where only African Americans will be in leadership. Mm-hmm. So a nice way of saying that story is is that although reconcil- racial reconciliation is a part of the origins, it doesn't yeah, hash out very well. It, yeah, it didn't work. It plays out. Well. Well, yeah, it didn't ways. work very well. But but I mean, that, like you said, this sounds like a lot of respondentary things. Like if if you uh, have been in ministry for fifteen years, and the only people who are trying to absolutely steal the church are a bunch of white guys, then the sake of unity, you go. Ah, yeah. White guys in leadership, no, I don't and we, we can, yeah, we can see easily how those kind. Not, not, I'm not. Nobody's justifying it here at this table either way. What Parham did or Seymour did, uh, but they both seem to be rather, rather reactionary kind of things. Yeah. If anybody asks you uh, who are the founders or who's the founder of um, Pentecostalism, I'd say if you want a doctrinal formulation, Jesus, I would go no. with Parham. Okay. If you want to go with a movement, yeah. Well, Seymour. the revival starts at Azusa, and that's Seymour. Uh, and so a lot, that's why a lot of folks today will s- say that the real founder is mm-hmm. Seymour. So again, what do you, what you, are is, you define How do you want to define it? You are you define, define it doctrinally yeah. or, or yeah. How, orthodoxy how do you or orthopraxy? Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so who did it best and who believed it best? Like that's, that's how we're That's, that's how not we're a bad way to it. say that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, okay. So, uh, uh, okay, so we have these two, these two founders, these two fathers of, of the Pentecostal movement, Charles Parham, William Seymour. We've talked about the historical kind of context of how, how does that hit the world? How does that first, first wave just transform uh, and impact the western western world all over the world yeah it is the fastest growing denomination in the world exactly and that's why it should be studied yeah uh, by people on the inside and on the outside oh i've always found fascinating that people travel to azusa in other words there is these network of christians uh they want i think the best way to talk about pentecostalism is that it is an experiential faith it's it's experience it is doctrinal. It's actually doctrinal conservative, but what makes it tick is experience. Yeah, they want to go there and get it. Yeah, they want to go there and get it. They want to go there and experience. You don't want to know just, y'all know this, you, know, you don't want to know uh, just about God. You want to know God. Yeah. You want to experience God. And let's go back to your word, uh, evangelism. What does it take to do evangelism? You want to have power. And so, you know, power can be a bad word, but, you know, Acts 1-8, you're yeah. going to have power. Go and wait in Jerusalem. You'll be yeah, clothed with exactly. power to be my witness. So there's this, there is this fascination with purity and power. We need to go out there and experience it. And what happens, a lot of people leave there. A guy named G.B. Cashwell goes back to North Carolina and spread the movement. Uh, the one that I am fascinated with, uh, he was a holiness Baptist uh, who becomes simply a holiness believer. His name is Charles Mason, C.H. Mason. He goes to um, Azusa, goes back to uh, Arkansas and Mississippi, and he splits with another Baptist, holiness Baptist named Charles Jones. Charles Jones becomes a founder of the Church of Christ Holiness, and C.H. Mason becomes a founder of the, what, what is now the largest African-American Pentecostal group, the Church of God and Christ. You know, Kojic, you've probably heard of that. Yep. And so then there's this one other story. I, you've got all these other names. You can start throwing out. Uh, the Church of God in Cleveland, Tennessee is A.J. Tomlinson. Uh, there's something called the Pentecostal Holiness Church. That, that all these groups, some groups that were holiness changed. They become Pentecostal. Some of them are new. Your former group, the Assemblies of God, I'm going to take a deep breath with this one. (laughs) It depends on what book you're reading, but a lot of the early uh, Assemblies of God leaders came out of of Baptist groups. A guy named Ian Bell, uh, Eudora Bell, um, actually went to the same Baptist school that I did uh, way back when. Uh, So you have like a Reformed element early on. You also have the Wesleyan element early on. You might see that. Uh, but when the Assemblies of God forms in 1914, a lot of the Assemblies of God folks came, had actually had some association with C.H. Mason, the African American. So it depends on who you read. Some folks will say that the Assemblies of God forms as a white denomination. Yeah, I've heard it. Yeah, okay. And so that's a part of the story as well. I do think you, however, I want to I'll mention one more name. And, and uh, you got to mention women in this early movement. Sure. Yeah, first egalitarian. Yeah, they movement. allow the Acts two. Uh, you know, young women, men, young women, young men, dream, Your sons dreams, and daughters prophesy. will prophesy. So yeah. you have women preachers. Yeah. Now, did you have women? You already had women preachers in holiness movement too. I mean, again, there's so much continuity here. But uh, early Pentecostalism does give space for spirit-filled women to preach and spirit-filled women to go on the mission field. The most famous and most controversial uh, is obviously Sister Amy. 
you move into the 20, yep. 1920s, and, and, and so you do have a church. She would have been the first formed. televangelist if, if cinema existed at that oh, time. Oh, she's it's unbelievable. Uh, there's program. so many books written about her, uh, and I, I wrote a chapter about her, and Baptist, Baptists were attracted to her, and yes, I think that's physically, and Baptists were afraid of her. They, they, uh, she was wa- dynamic. She was she theatrical. Was, yeah, she was. She brought. Uh, I would say there are two big folks in the in the twenties. One's not charismatic. That's Billy Sunday, whom you know. Uh, he would get up on the stage and do Hollywood kind of Broadway. He would slide safe into home, away from the devil. But you also have Sister Amy. She was uh, great with radio. She builds this Angelus Temple out in L.A. I mean, there's a long history there. Uh, she comes out of the Assemblies of God. In some ways, you could just say that she was just too big for a denomination. She didn't want to be controlled by that. Didn't she create a denomination? In she does. Four Square? It's, it's interesting. The Church of the Four Square Gospel. Yeah. And isn't the Four Square no, the Four Square Gospel sounded eerily familiar to the holiness? Oh, four does. points of holiness that you mentioned. Yeah, she said. Uh, now this another thing. She said that she got this as a revelation from God, and so early Pentecostalism does affirm. Um, okay, let me rephrase that. You have conversion. You have we didn't use the language, but you have a first blessing of conversion. You have a second blessing. Second blessing theology. Second blessing theology, and that would be Holy Spirit baptism mm-hmm. uh, with tongues. You have, and then you all of a sudden have the different views on tongues. Uh, some some folks still talk about uh, sanctification as a blessing, and so they have a fight over this, and some of them don't. And so the Assemblies of God start talking about, uh, well, self, sanctification is progressive. And others say, well, wait a minute, no, it's, 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 it's kind of the old so West. Church thing. of God or Church of God Yeah, in Church, of, I, Church, I Church of God in Cleveland, Tennessee, I would tell you, has a five-fold gospel. And so, let's, so then when you get to, to Amy, you have um, Christ as Savior. Watch, Christ as Sanctifier drops out. Mm-hmm. Christ is Healer. Christ is Baptizer with the Holy Spirit, and Christ is Coming King. So if you do have these early distinctives, you want you got to use those four. Savior, that's very evangelical, right? Um, healer, all right, faith healing, divine healing evangelism. Uh, but baptism of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, uh, Amy would talk about tongues as being the sign, what mm-hmm. I was calling classical Pentecostal. And then you have the imminent second coming of Christ. And so women uh, preach. There are, there are, even in the Assemblies of God, they start having major conflict over women c- can be ordained. So there's a difference between preaching sure. and ordained pastoral ministry. Uh, but again, early Pentecostalism usually says racial reconciliation is part of that story, allowing women to preach earlier than other groups. That, that becomes a part of the story, too. Uh, but Amy is fascinating. You're exactly right. She's, in some ways, she helps mainstream Pentecostalism because people who aren't Pentecostals will go to her church. Uh, Hollywood folks will go to Angela's Temple. I was reading a book just two weeks ago, Charlie Chaplin. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, these are old names. we got to have some older guests out there. Milton Burl. Mm-hmm. Milton Burl actually claimed to know Amy in a rather close way. I mean, whether he did or not, but he knew he knew her. So she really does help mainstream. Uh, She's got to pay that temple somehow. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, Amy. Amy had trouble no, with her. Way, Amy yeah. had trouble with her mother. Uh, in fact, Amy's most famous event uh, is a 1926 scandal where she disappears, and folks, uh, many folks to this day believe that uh, she had an affair. Well, and that, that this, Catherine Coleman had a similar disappearance yeah, in the 60s. Yeah. Now, Amy's followers still to this day, uh, Amy's followers will tell you, no, it was a kidnapping because that's what she claimed it to be. So, yeah. Anyways, I, I would want to include, you do have uh, Parham, you do have Seymour, you have all these big, um, oh, what you call founders of denominations. Sure. But I really think you have to put Amy uh, in a part of this story too. I'm just curious because uh, if we're including the the latter rain guys as part of the first wave would you include them as part of the first wave or would you say that was second yeah, wave? transitional fig- can i can i cheat and say they're transitional they're, they're one they and are, and a half wave. i think they have a distinctive theology i mean the okay. the, the very title sec or latter rain i mean that implies a theology and eschatology that okay. goes with it they are borrowing that phrase Mm-hmm. That phrase is already around. In fact, one of the earliest uh, period, uh, one of the fascinating things about early Pentecostals is, that is, is think about this. You believe Jesus is coming back real soon. I mean, the imminent coming of Christ. 
but you produce tons and tons of periodicals. In fact, if you really want to do research in a religion, uh, Pentecostal archives have digitized their materials better than Baptists or Methodists to this mm, day. And it's all over at CFNI. Oh, it's unbelievable. It's the material on there is so rich. It, it really is rich. Uh, but one of those early uh, periodicals is called the Latter Rain Evan- Evangel. The Latter Rain Evangel. So it is. I would love to read that. That would be yeah. fascinating. So you are right. Latter Rain is is a distinctive. Former rain, maybe spiritual gifts during the Bible times. Now we're right here toward the end, latter rain. So again, I guess they're latter rain folks of the 40s. I, I, it depends on who you read. I would call them trends. So, so as, a, as a Baptist guy, you'd say, I'm not a Pentecostal. But the claim that the Pentecostal faith came out of Azusa Street, some random event in 1904, uh, 1906. The, the reclaim 1906. Thank you. The reclaiming of uh, the, the the language of tongues. This has uh, never happened before since since the early church has been ceased and it's been reclaimed at this moment. You would say that's a bit of elaboration. That's that's taking too many uh, liberties. That the, the these it's doctrines too much credit have existed much way before this yeah, exactly. and have, were popularized through Azusa. You're really telling. What uh, insiders, people who are Pentecostal, there's, there's an evolution of how they describe the story. Mm. Early Pentecostal histories would say, we popped up on the scene. Mm-hmm. It, it's a miracle that came in, in 1906. Uh, Pentecostal historian, whatever, theologian today will say, well, no, we understand what their continuities yeah, now, they they might emphasize 1901 and 1906 for sure, but they understand the continuities. Um, I haven't used the word. Uh, one of the best ways to describe Pentecostalism is that it is a restorationist movement. Sure. It's the idea that you're restoring the New Testament. Yep. Going back to the early days. Grassroots. Kind of Watch. They're not the only folks that did that. Yeah. You know, Church a- of Christ is doing it now. Church of Christ is known for that. Yeah. Uh, I've written about Baptists being restorationists. If you ever heard, and this is bad history, but if you ever hear a Baptist say, we're not Protestants, we go back to John the Baptist, that's horrible history. <laughs> But it's it's a it's horrible. The King James so, Bible. It yeah, was good it's enough it's for John the Baptist. Oh, gosh, it's good enough it's, for me. Come on, we come out of the Puritans in the 1600s. But what is that? We are we are the New Testament Church. That's the the claim from every denomination yeah. is we really figured it out exactly. Well, the, the Methodists did it too. They would talk about sure. the apostolic uh, purity. The Catholic Church in 1870 they declare uh, the papal infallibility of the Pope. That's kind of going, we're the best. I mean, you can look at almost every group. Well, and they cl- claim apostolic secession, that, that Clement, yeah, yeah, exactly. you know, was the, the you second have the bishop or a po- pope of... Yeah. So, But you still have that, you just kind of have this key moment when everybody's doing it uh, in the late 19th century. Um, if you want to talk about it, Pentecostals in reference to everybody else, well, let's, let's go back to the Baptists. The Baptists okay. will say, hey, we do it right. We, we are Bible literal followers. We, we have believers' baptism by immersion, which, by the way, I think believers' baptism by immersion is good. We're, we're all big fans of that here. Yeah, watch. <laughs> Pentecostalism can come along and go, well, yeah, that's, that's in the Bible, but we follow the whole Bible. So sometimes it's <laughs> called the full, full gospel. Yeah. You got... You got half the gospel. We got the it's so messed it, up. Again, it's what I, you and I were talking about earlier: the haves and the have-nots. Dude, it, well, it is... in the sense that you're uh, you're practicing all the spiritual gifts, and right. so it does come down to that word uh, cessationism. So some folks go, "Oh, that was done in the first century. It's not done since. We don't have to do any more." And Pentecostals will go, "Who said that?" Yeah. I just got done filming like an eight-part series with uh, Josh Hoffert on the patristics okay. and how uh, the patristic fathers frequently talked about, uh, uh, instructed the church on how to practice these spiritual gifts and how are they to, to be formative and functional within the body of Christ. So hopefully that will come out in Good. Like, January. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but but uh, w- when we're talking about these these early Pentecostal groups and, and how there was infighting, it's it's odd how the Holy Spirit that's supposed to bring unity and unify uh, seems to be this this marker of, again, the haves and haves nots. How can we criticize and say that that these people are less spiritual than we are, less sanctified than we are, left, get less gifted than we are? How, how would you approach this, as, again, as a Baptist guy coming to this situation, say, how, how do we talk about uh, the, those who are Pentecostal, those who are not Pentecostal, what would be appropriate language to talk about our brothers this way in a way that doesn't cause further division, but in a way that's rather unifying? Oh, that's a great question. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to criticize a bunch of folks here. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to criticize a bunch of folks who did it wrong, and I'll tell you how to um, do it right. You, sh- you know, anybody that talks about the full gospel, 
uh, implies that everybody else has got the half. Everybody gospel. else has got the that's half. Right. Spirit filled. Um, that means you go to the church that's not so yeah, spirit filled. If, if you claim to be spirit filled, I mean, I've been in a Baptist setting where somebody has gone through uh, some. This was back in the nineties, and they went through what's called a master life. Um, discipleship program. Well, you now have a certificate in the Master Life. So is it master's Commission? Is it the... I think so. Yeah. Uh, it's been a while since I remember that. Um, but watch, any, any language that says we have it and you don't... But, yeah. but almost every group has done that. So, oh, we have apostolic succession. So what you might call the high churches, you, we, let's just criticize them for that. The, <laughs> the Baptists have done it. We are, we are the New Testament church. So... We're just a bunch the of thing, here's the irony of church history. <laughs> Anytime somebody says, we have the thing that will unify the church, mm. it often divides. The, the holiness movement actually uses the same language. If everybody will have the doctrine and experience the second blessing of sanctification, it will unify the church. Well, it ended up not. <laughs> In the larger history of Christianity— the church has said unify around the Eucharist, yeah. the Lord's Supper. Well, what is the what is the most divisive? <laughs> one of the, I yeah, mean, everybody can agree. On. I mean, Martin yeah. Luther, real and, presence, uh, symbolism. Yeah, yeah. It, you got you got real presence. You got transubstantiation. You got a memorial, and so we have divided over that. So it, it ought to make us humble. Anytime a group in Christian history has said this is, if you'll all rally around this, it has divided. Mm. That's that will say that that ought to, that ought to stop okay, us a little bit. Okay, let me back up a little bit because we just touched on this, but you said the, the, the latter rain movement would have been considered a transitional between what's considered first and second wave. Uh, defining marker of latter rain, what is that eschatology all about? Um, Why do they call it the latter rain? Well, because it, it's getting ready to end, and you, you have prophecy— uh, that can dictate the end. So let's talk about premillennial eschatology, dispensation. I mean, it's fascinating. You have dispensational eschatology. If I'm using language here, you know, the world gets worse and worse and worse. Dispensationalism, but then Jesus intervenes and takes some groups out in the rapture. Is that language familiar, obviously, yeah. to your listeners? So, I mean, to me, latter rain. Don't give us too I, much I know it is to y'all, but but <laughs> but to me, latter rain simply goes. We're we're at the end time. And so you got to do this now. You need to listen to us now. See, we have the prophecy now. Uh, what is what is the role of prophecy? Is prophecy preaching? Okay, if you're a Baptist, prophecy is just preaching. But in Pentecostal or charismatic or holiness groups, uh, it's it's not simply that. It's maybe a, an immediate word from the Lord that might and not necessarily foretelling or it, no, 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 it, it no, could not, include not that. Right. But it might, but it might be a new word mm. from the Lord that reveals something about Scripture. But watch though in those cases. Okay, let's go back to the person I said I wrote my first uh, study of, William Branham. Branham uh, didn't have much education, but he would kind of use Old Testament language, thus saith the Lord. And also, he's in the 1940s. And King James is more popular then. <laughs> yeah. People began to, to take whatever he said as the authoritative interpretation, interpretation of the Bible Okay, latter rain, it, it, why? Because you're at the end of time. So what ends up happening is that the interpretation becomes equal with the Bible. That's right. Okay, you end up no different a, than the popal, papal infallibility. Yeah, and, and so you can't question it. If you're, a real good, if you're a real disciple, you won't question this. And you have some of that, oh, uh, you're going to have guests in the future that will talk more about this, but the shepherding movement in the yep. 1970s, yeah, yeah, yeah. it does that. So it, and, it is this risk of what is the role of, of, of new revelation? If you're open to new revelation, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of power in that. There's a lot of excitement in that, that. That God's speaking to you in ways that those boring. There's a lot of instability and a lot of control in that too. Of course it is. Well, and that's but, uh, we've talked course, about this. And there's at there's, great an, length. there's an authoritarian. We haven't talked about it on the podcast. There's an authoritarianism though. in that. No, there's there is a um, a very slippery slope. There is a very Oh, what I'm concerned about the most with the come to the scripture, read the, the, the Bible, and then ask God for a spiritual allegorization of those texts, the, the most concerning thing, uh, because I'm, I'm going to go ahead and give some of these guys the benefit of the doubt and say that they're not going to come to 
ungodly, unbiblical conclusions with those allegories, but they're communicating to the audience, this is the interpretation of this. And and they are paralyzed they, they at looking the at the scriptures. They become the authority as well yeah. in that moment, and which to me is, it's instead of having one pope, you have many popes. Exactly. And the charismatic movement is rampant with having... We have plenty of popes. Yeah, it's this question yeah. of authority. Yeah, and, sure. and we, you know, uh, we would identify ourselves in we the continuation. We need to do an episode camp. on this. this let's, let's talk about this because we only got 10 minutes left. Um, when when uh, we were talking about this today, I would say that being raised in the Assemblies of God Church and we we're looking at people in other churches, like say uh, they're in a Baptist church and they're speaking in tongues, right? They got the baptism of the Holy Spirit over there in the Baptist church. Well, they're Pentecostals now. Right now, now you were raised in more conservative evangelicalism. I, I was uh, DTS, Dallas Theological Seminary. So I went to a Bible church. I was Jewish. Your pastor went years to DTS. Yeah. Well, every pastor I went to from from uh, every church I went to had a pastor that came out of DTS. So, yeah, cessationist all the way. I uh, had an experience with the gifts, and so I would never consider myself Pentecostal. Like to me. That comes with it certain doctrines that I absolutely disagree with. Second blessing theology being one of them. The idea that that uh, tongues would be either an evidence or a evidence. I don't either one. I'm really kind of like, eh, whatever. Yeah. Um, so when we when we're trying to define what is Pentecostal, right? So so we stop calling the wrong people Pentecostal. Uh, uh, what we talk about first wave Pentecostal. If I was to go and walk and find someone. Uh, in, in a random corner that says, hey, I'm, I'm a Christian, and I'm going to say, you are or n- are not a Pentecostal. What is the defining mark? Uh, that's a, that's a heavy well, question. Well, I think you need to go to, um, let me, I think you need to go to the four square gospel. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Holiness? Well, What's four square again, being Amy Simple McPherson. I, 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 Amy comes 20 years later, okay. but I think that her her doctrines are simply a culmination of what's been developing. They're, they're a proper articulation. I think so. Okay. Yeah. And so four square is conversion. That's you know, within the event. There is debate about whether Pentecostals were fundamentalists or not, but the thing about that, they really weren't kissing cousins. They hated each other. But <laughs> they really did. Okay. You, you have Jesus is safe. Oh, they did. I mean, uh, they did. If it looks like a duck, there quacks was, like a duck, uh, it's a duck. I, I get myself in trouble here, but the, the church over here in Fort Worth um, that's the legacy of J. Frank Norris, there was never a lie. He didn't know how to tell. Uh, and, 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 and he he we're, started we're well he, he, he I know, yeah 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 he Here's RC Sproul. About, can i say that oh, yeah he, go ahead he um <laughs> he talked about uh pentecostalism as oily mcphersonism oh yeah and it's the use of james 5 oil yeah yeah like, but anointing it. people they just always yeah, have a, all uh, that so but let's, let's go of it on them. jesus is savior okay jesus is healer mm-hmm Jesus is baptizer with the Holy Spirit, and the sign for that is tongues. Gotcha. And Jesus is coming king. I mean, I think that's the core in terms of not only the doctrine, but also the practice. You're, you're practicing an acceptance of new revelation. You're practicing prophecy. You're practicing all the spiritual gifts. It is an experience-based. Why is Pentecostalism so attractive? So attractive? It's because it's experience-based. Okay, so when if I were to say, so I'm just going to try to to pick apart those. So right there in that in that example, so I look that at make one me Pentecostal. Uh, no, because uh, initial physical evidence, right? Yeah, I Baptism. just I wouldn't buy into that. So so we look at initial physical evidence. I go, no, I don't believe in that. No, when you say Jesus is the healer, what does that mean when you say that? Because because I go, yeah, absolutely, Jesus is the healer. Yeah, Jesus can heal people. He's going to raise us from the now, dead. Now we'll does that mean that he always 100 percent every time you pray for somebody get like what when you say jesus is healer what is that doctrine and how is that hashed out in the healer in the group? sense that will be raised up second life or uh, okay a typical person today jesus is the healer he's a yeah. great physician you sing about it when you get sick you go to the doctor yeah you go to the doctor that's right okay early pentecostalism no doctors. There was a debate about going, well, they were doctors, but they didn't always trust them. You know, it's okay. not medicine They just today. drank a lot of wine. But because <laughs> that's what Paul he encouraged yeah, Timothy. Yeah. Well, should you <laughs> go to the doctor? <laughs> should you go to the doctor? Some of these early testimonies was, I went to doctors. I didn't have enough faith, and now I have my faith in Jesus. Sure, I got my kids vaccinated. Now they have Down syndrome. Yeah, kind of and thing. so it, it it is a what I mean by Jesus the healer. Dude, I mean super sparks na- controversy I mean, there. Supernatural healing. Gotcha. Extra medicine. 
So in some now does that does that develop? You can go to the doctor today here in Dallas, and your doctor could be penny cost or fine. But in this early period, it's a focus on uh, miraculous healing. Okay. And it's you know having faith in God to provide. He- and so Amy was a healer. F. F. Bosworth was a healer. Charles Parham started off was a theologian. As a healer. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, you started so, off as a healer. Got you know, it. Okay. And, and, and then he was a tonger. Focus on. Uh, the, the miracle of, of you. <laughs> I just, and that's uh, a good place to wrap that up. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, it's like your last episode, so you're like, I'm going to get him in there. <laughs> Balls to the walls here, man. <laughs> this is not good, Michael. I got I to gotta keep this up after this. Yeah, bro. yeah. Let yeah. me say one thing before this is all over. Sure, yeah. sure. All throughout the last hundred years, people who might practice spiritual gifts but say I'm not Pentecostal, it might be because, okay, I, I have a doctrinal difference over tongues, but by and large, it was a social stigma attached to the word. You were lower class, sure. you were uneducated, you were anti-intellectual. And so while all other mainstream groups are moving towards social respectability, you just aren't that. It, it just has a stigma to it. And we I'm were talking about that on the that, phone. I'm we not agree. saying that's yeah. accurate. I'm not saying it. I, has, I don't want to be lumped in with uneducated and not thoughtful and, and careful in my we're, theology. We're, we're, I mean, so I, I, I legitimately believe that the initial physical evidence doctrine, uh, when I was in Assemblies of God, non denomination, uh, was Assemblies of God Church, and uh, some of the professors there were Assemblies of God. Um, and they would they would teach. Yeah, we believe that the baptism is an evidence, but not sure. the evidence. Uh, and they they were lucky because they they had been in the denomination so long, where it's like you know they've been in it longer than the presbyter that was in charge. So they're like, yeah, we're not going to catch you for this. Well, again, the the thing diversifies. Seymour gets to where he says it's simply one of the evidences. Right. F. F. Bosworth, whom I just mentioned a minute ago, uh, Assemblies of God has to leave the group because he says it's just one of the evidences. Mm. So you need to mess the story up. Yeah. But classical Pentecostalism says that tongues is the sign, and then you just have all these other exceptions. So first wave Pentecostalism, we'll call it classical Pentecostalism. Second wave, we'll just call second wave. Or neo Pentecostalism or second wave or whatever. That would be second wave, neo Pentecostalism? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Sometimes called well, charismatic renewal, but sure. Yeah, we're gonna good. we're actually gonna have uh, a second. Uh, what is it? Is it, would you consider him a second wave or a third wave guy? Uh, Lairdin. Uh, Lairdin. No, first wave. He's first wave. Absolutely. Well, Roberts Lairdin's coming on next week, so he's gonna be coming on talking about second wave Pentecostalism as far as our second wave. Full stop. Uh, and then we'll try to figure out someone for third wave stuff. I don't know. So, so a lot of this stuff is it's, it's, it's an interesting. It. It's an interesting world to kind of navigate. Because it's like uh, there's so much similarity, really, when we're talking to these people about what is first wave, what is second wave, what is third wave. I go, yeah, I, I resonate with a whole lot of that. But a lot of this is not just theological. It's the way that this is expressed. And you can like you can go into a church real quick and figure out if they're first, second, or third wave by the experience of the service. Like you said, that's sure. that's the Pentecostal marker. Is it, it is an experience. So uh, really enjoyed the episode. Honored to have you on. For those of you who are still watching, man, we've got a link uh, to Dr. Weaver's book in the description is there, and is a couple there of resources. Is there other things that, that they should – do you have a website? Do you have a blog? Yeah. Do you have anything else you want to let people know about? Uh, is there ways that people can, like, legally stalk you? <laughs> That's what he was asking. Uh, I'm on Facebook and Twitter, but I don't, I don't, oh, you I tweet, don't do a do lot you? of that. So um, – <laughs> He doesn't yeah. get Twitter read, read the book. And in fact, you can get the Branham book pretty cheaply. So both both of those things are still out there. But What's the Branham book, book again? It's, it's uh, uh, A Paradigm of the Prophetic, uh, William Marion Branham, uh, William Mary 1909, Branham. 1965. It's pretty fascinating. He was a pretty fascinating guy. But yeah, this book, really, if you want to have uh, interaction with one group with holiness, one group with early Pentecostalism, one group with charismatic movement, um, I would suggest give my book a try. If you've yeah. never read a history of the charismatic movement, this charismatic story is told through one group, the Baptists. Mm. Uh, I, so, I think it sounds fascinating. I'm excited to read it. So, so anyways, thanks for plugging it. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, coming. It was an honor. Uh, for those of you who are still watching, uh, you can watch Remnant Radio every Monday night, 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. So Let's get fun. this uh, Baptist baptized in the spirit. I say tongue in cheek, That's not messy. being at Pentecost. So for, he's really <laughs> trying to get kicked off the show. Uh, uh, it, it, upcoming episodes: we've got Dr. Michael Brown coming on soon. We've got Andrew Wilson coming on here pretty soon. We've got uh, Robert Salirden. We've got uh, Michael Heiser coming on twice in December. So if you are watching, stay tuned. It only gets better. 
And go check out our old videos. Still, my favorite video. Go watch done. our old videos because I won't be on any Stop of the new ones. Stop doing that to the scriptures. That's, That's my favorite one. one. Go check it out. Yeah. Blessings, guys.